meeting of the Council of 15 September 2021. We stood the government advice and practice social and, pra and to practice social distancing. This meeting will be held virtually. The meeting is being recorded and will be available via the Council's website to be viewed as soon as is practical following the meeting. Everyone participating in the meeting will be accessing this meeting from remote locations. Please remember to ensure that mobile phones are switched off or to silent mode. Members will have received an electronic copy of the agenda. And I will ask officers to present a summary of key points. For the record, the agenda can be viewed on the Council's website. Members and officers will be speaking at various points during this meeting, and those speaking may switch the cameras on at that point. But I ask that, with the exception of myself as mayor, and all other times, you keep your cameras and microphones switched off, as this will help to minimise any background noise and interference, and to ensure the connection remains as stable as possible. If any members and officers wish to raise a point or question, they should use the hands up icon on the screen, and I'll come to you in order to receive requests. Please do not use your microphone until I invite you to do so. Please lower your hand once you have finished speaking. Please also do not use the chat function as on Teams we cannot clear any text on the meeting recording. In the event the council requires the vote on an item of business before it, at this meeting the mountain officer will call out the name of each member present in turn and request them to vote verbally either for, against or abstain. And then ask the mountain officer to announce the result of the vote and council's decision on the item. Officers from Democratic Services and ICT will be supporting the meeting and will be monitoring the use of microphones throughout the meeting and, where necessary, will move those not being used. Before we formally commence, I now ask the officer from Democratic Services to announce the names of the councillors in attendance at this meeting. And I'd also ask the officer to introduce themselves as and when I invite them to speak during the course of the meeting. They too should ensure microphones and cameras are switched off when not in use. So we now work our way through the agenda. So item one. Sorry, we're going to announce our members present first. Sorry, Michael. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, members in attendance today are Councillor Alex Williams, Councillor Amanda Williams, Councillor Anil Bachella, Councillor Bryce Sedgbeer, Councillor Carolyn Webster, Councillor Cheryl Green, Councillor Keith Edwards, Councillor Denisha Patel, Councillor Elaine Venables, Councillor Gareth Howells. Councillor Gary Thomas, Councillor Hugh David, Councillor Harold Williams, Councillor Jane Gebby, Councillor Janice Lewis, Councillor John McCarthy, Councillor John Spanswick, yourself as chairperson, Councillor John Paul Blundell, Councillor Julia Williams, Councillor Ken Watts, Councillor Martin Jones, Councillor Mike Clark, Councillor Nora Clark, Councillor Pam Davis, Councillor Paul Davis, Councillor Richard Collins, Councillor Richard Young, Councillor Malcolm James, Councillor Roz Sturman, Councillor Sadie Vidal, Councillor Sean Aspey, Councillor Stuart Baldwin, Councillor Tom Beadle, Councillor Ross Penhill Thomas, Councillor Kay Rowlands, and Councillor Tim Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Michael. Um, and moving on to item one, then, apologies for absence. Um, there's quite a few apologies. I just shout out the names that have been given at the moment. The apologies from Councillor Rod Shaw. Uh, it was Councillor, I think Councillor Richard, Richard Young is present now. I think, yeah. Councillor Mike Kern, Councillor Lynn Walters, Councillor Steve Smith, Councillor Alta Hussain, Councillor Jeff Tisley, Councillor Mary Hughes may join late later on in the meeting, Councillor Tom Gifford, Councillor David White, Councillor Brian Jones. Councillor Nicole Burnett, Councillor Richard Granville, and Councillor James Radcliffe. Are there any other apologies to add to that list? Right, I can see a hand raised, but I don't know who it is. Hang on. Councillor Alex Williams. Uh, Councillor Saul Dendy, please. Right, Councillor Saul Dendy. Any other apologies? Hang on. Councillor Gareth Howells. Uh, councillor Councillor Philip White, I don't think you called his name out, yeah. No, I didn't. Councillor Philip White as well. I'm just trying to see on the screen. Councillor Janice Lewis. 
Um, so Janice Lewis, you have your hand raised. No. Councillor Steele Baldwin. Chair, if you don't mind, uh, Councillor Janice Lewis was just having trouble um, in a previous meeting with a microphone not working. So while her camera may come on, we don't know if we can hear her. Um, but while I'm on, if you will oh, yeah. um, just indulge me, I, we seem to have a, a Williams of County Primary School and also, and also Councillor Amanda Williams in uh, at both logged in as participants. So um, I'm presuming that A Williams is also Councillor Amanda Williams and one of those will need to be logged out, please. Yes, thank you for that. Can we check that, please, and have the appropriate Councillor Amanda that, Williams? That, that, yeah, they're both me. Sorry, I've got problems as well. I've got to speak on my mobile phone, and I'm trying to listen on my laptop, but I'll log out of my laptop now for you. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor okay. Janice Lewis? Councillor Lewis, was you? You did come on the screen, but now you've gone again. Okay. Oh, comes with Janice Lewis. Can you hear me now, Chair? Yeah. Can you hear you now? Yeah. Oh, great. Um, you want to hear now? <laughs> Sorry, just to say that Councillor David Lewis has been called to an emergency, an urgent meeting, and will be later attending. Okay. Right. Thank you. We record that as well. Okay. I think that's all. Apologies, wraps is done then. Right, item two then, declarations of interest. To receive declarations of personal and prejudicial interest from members or officers in accordance with members' code of conduct adopted the Council from 1st September 2008. Councillor Gareth Owells. Chair, I'd like to declare a, a, an interest in relation to item 10, as I know the two individuals whose names are, are asked to be renominated from the time sitting with them on an employment uh, tribunal. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Mr. Malcolm James. Yeah, thank you, Mr. I'm declaring interest in item eight in social services on the children sections. Uh, Mr. Mayor, my wife chairs the fostering panel for BCBC. Right, okay. So I will take no part probably in any discussion that arises from children's services. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, Councillor Levine Venables. Hi, right, yeah. Can I declare an interest in item nine as I'm actually a serving magistrate at the moment? Thank you. Right. Uh, Kelly Watson. Oops. Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I need to declare prejudicial interest in item number 13 and I'll be leaving the meeting uh, while that one's debated. OK, thank you. Councillor Martin Jones, I think I know who it is. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Along with Councillor Venables, I also um, state uh, an interest, a personal interest into item nine. I am also a city magistrate at Cardiff. Thank you. Right. Right, there's no further indications, I can see. No. OK, so we move moving on to item three then. The approval of the minutes of the 21st of July 2021. Move. Move, let me second. 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 Councillor Watts. Watts. Yes, the uh, you, on the minutes it shows me as chairing that meeting and not yourself. That's true. Can, that can be corrected, I take it. Yep. Thanks, Councillor Watts. Right, so we moved and seconded. We all okay with those minutes? With the right. amendment? Right, thank you. That's item three then. So we allow um, arrange for the invitees from Vice Coast to be admitted to the meeting. Mark, Mike, uh, is that being done now? Yes, uh, Mr. Mayor, just admitted them now. <laughs> Welcome all to the meeting. We'll um, come to 
Joe, is it Joe? You like being no, no, Joanne, Joe, 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 and your team, you and all your team are welcome. But we'll um, <coughs> we're on item four of the agenda. We'll just go through the uh, to I think first the uh, report itself. And who's taking his water, Kelly? I will, um, Mr. Mayor, if that's okay. Right, if we can do the report first, then please. I mean, after the presentation after the report has been uh, dealt with. No, no problem. For for the benefit of the recording, it's Mark Shepherd, Chief Executive. Um, Mr. May, I don't think there's there's a whole lot to say about this report. I hope it's relatively straightforward. Uh, you will recall that we have a, a series of presentations from key partners who come to council during the course of the calendar year. Uh, the others are actually set out in the report under paragraph 4.2 and include the Police and Crime Commissioner and Chief Constable, Kumtaf uh, Organic Health Board. Um, and the South Wales Fire and Rescue Authority. Um, and we also have V2C, as you know, who uh, as part of the, uh, our relationship with V2C uh, also come here and indeed to scrutiny on an annual basis to update on their work and to give members an opportunity to also question uh, key officers. Um, so beyond that, uh, Mr Mayor, I don't think there's there's, there's a great deal to, to go through in the report. The rest of it is for information. And I think without further ado, back to you to, uh, uh, to yeah. let our, our guests introduce themselves. Okay, can we first have a move and a second for the report? Item four. Move. Second. Second of the report, as, if, as far as the future presentations. Right, thank you for that. You're all happy with that report? And now we'll move. Right. To the actual presentation from uh, Bysley Coast. I believe there's a presentation that Joe and the team have. And what I suggest is we have the presentation and any questions will be left to the end after the, after the presentation, not in between the presentation. And for the questions to refrain from being individual specific cases that members may have, concentrate on strategic matters. Um, otherwise, we could be here all evening. If you got so, please, all members might have questions, but not individual cases and, and specific names mentioned. We just concentrate on strategic matters if we can, please. So. Joanne, over to you. I'm just assuming you're going to share the screen here or do whatever technology does. That's working. Can't you, Joe? Microphone's off. Apologies. Can you hear me now and can you see the presentation? Yep, that's great. OK, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. So, uh, Pranam Darpal, and good afternoon, everybody, and I hope you're all keeping well. A you know, big thank you for inviting us today and giving me the opportunity to speak to you about what Valley Sakos has been up to since we met with you last, which is a year ago now. Um, I'm also joined by members of some of my members of the leadership team, and I'm hoping these are all familiar with you now, um, and each of them will contribute to the presentation. But for those who are new, in order of the screen, we have um, Darren, our Corporate Director of Development and Growth, Emma, our Corporate Director of Housing, Communities and Customers, and Sarah, our Director of Communications. So as many of you know, having stepped out of the shadows of the pandemic this summer, you know, Valley to Coast is currently in a period of optimistic change and improvement since our last annual catch-up. The majority of our colleagues have had to continue to work from home, which has resulted in interruption of our services and a delay in our repairs and maintenance. But, you know, as our business and the organisation now is building back to full strength, and as I've communicated to many of you already, we have dedicated necessary resources to be able to prioritise and focus at the, on the delay of our services, which have primarily been around our repairs and maintenance. Now, this has been in the form of a turnaround pro programme. Um, and what we've done here is brought experts from across the business and to bring them together to get up to speed and make sure that we are starting to deliver swiftly and to high standards. Our priorities have been focused around our repairs, filling all our empty homes, and adaptations, our complaints and compliance. And I'm hoping really what I'm sharing you, with you now in terms of our priorities is not new, but what I would like to report is the progress that we have seen in just over what's been 12 weeks now since we've put this intervention in place. 
And you know what we've seen is we're continuing to um, repair our new jobs that are coming in, and we've completed 80% of new jobs. But we are also making sure we're, we we are eating away at the backlog of repairs. And to date, we completed 647 of those backlog repairs. We have um, re-let 26 homes. We've completed 137 adaptations and really have strengthened our partnership working with Bridge End Care and Repair and the Community Occupational Health Therapist to help speed up our processes. Um, with regards to complaints, we've now closed 39% of our complaints and resolved them successfully. We've completed 50 pest control cases. And again, we've been working with officers with BCBC, the SHIT, um, Regulatory Service, Natural Resources Wales, to ensure that we're building a multi-agency partnership approach to be able to deal with the pest issues that we're facing in the borough. So um, I thought, you know, it was really important that, you know, just to give you bring up to speed and what has happened over the that 12 week period. But we're also focusing on trying to understand what our customers want and need post pandemic. And we've been doing this by consulting and upping our engagement moving forward. So we have a new customer engagement strategy. I've sent correspondence out to our customers. We're getting feedback on our new website to make sure that it offers the service our tenants want and need. Um, and we've also um, brought customers together to be part of the panel to choose our next board members. Um, we know we can't just rely on tradi traditional mail and digital way uh, ways to engage with our customers. We know we still have a high proportion of our customers who are digitally excluded. So we are going back out now safely, COVID safely, into our communities to be able to speak directly with our customers. And we've also got our consultation van, Reggie, back out on the road. So they're going out into our community so that we can um, have a chat with customers. And now is a real good time as the biannual statement lands that we can go out and explain where their rent money goes. Uh, Emma will come in a bit later to talk to you about um, some of the work we've been doing with our communities and some of the customer benefits and engagement. But what I'd just like to share with you is our short video, which explains the commitment to our new refreshed customer engagement strategy.
Okay, thank you. We've also reverted um, back to our name of Valleys to Coast, so a real just gentle, you know, polite request to no longer refer to us as V2C. And I'm hoping many of you will have seen our uh, refresh branding where we've reintroduced the Welsh translation, um, showing our commitment to the Welsh language. And for those of you who haven't, who are, who are unfamiliar with the story behind our logo, I just thought it'd be a good opportunity to show you this quick explainer video so that you know what we stand for and what's behind our logo and Valleys to Coast. Turnaround programme is forms part of the brilliant basic stage of our recently launched 10 year corporate plan, which maps all of our strategic priorities in three stages. So this takes us from our foundation stage, which is really laying those solid foundation the organisation needs to be able to allow us to build and grow. And it was really important that we have this roadmap post pandemic to ensure that throughout the organisation, we are focused on our core purpose as a housing association to create homes where customers feel safe and happy. Now, this is the very essence. Sorry, Joe, the screen is froze. Let me ask you. Exist as a business. It's not you, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> You're breaking up, Joe. It's freezing. Can you hear me? No. No. Have I come back now? So I should I try and turn my try turn my camera off. Just try the camera off. I expect can you, you, you know. Can you hear? Me? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. Okay. Did you hear about the corporate plan? No. OK, so if I, I'll just pick up from where the video left in terms of saying what I want to say is about our current turnaround programme is very much part of our brilliant basics of our recently uh, launched corporate plan, which sets out a 10 year pathway. Given all our strategic priorities in terms of three stages of um, the first stage is all about laying the solid foundations of the organisation, which will allow us to build and grow. You know, it was really important for us to have this roadmap post pandemic. So we ensured that throughout the organisation, we were really staying focused on our core purpose as a housing association to create homes where customers feel safe and happy. You now, this is the very essence of why we exist as a business and drives all our strategic priorities. We recognise the safe and happy customers living in safe and happy homes need to have those safe and happy places. 
which is why we're focused on giving back to the communities where our customers live and invest in what they tell us they need. And even though we had that challenging first half of the year, and since we last met at the annual meeting, you know, we've been in lockdown, we have still been able to deliver more for our communities. And that's ranged from creating a schoolyard to making sure we have benches, bus stops, and communal great green spaces in the right places. What COVID has shown us is how important green space and access to nature is when it comes to wellbeing. But I'll let Emma talk to you about what else we've done within our community. So I'll hand over to Emma here. Okay, Emma. Hi. Oh, the connection is okay with the video on, perhaps? <laughs> I hope so. Keep your fingers crossed, everyone. Okay. Uh, so uh, as Joe said, I'm Emma Howells, and I'm the Corporate Director for Housing uh, Communities and Customers. So I'm going to take you through some of the community benefits that Valleys to Coast have created during the last year, even with the restraints of COVID due to our thriving community strategy and how we've upped our engagement with our customers. As an organisation, we focused on maximising the impact we have on our communities with all the things that we do, embracing all opportunities as a key organisation in Bridge End to support the local supply chain and utilise our investments to improve social, economic and environmental well-being across the, across the country. We do this by ensuring our procurement procedures take social value and impact into account. For example, we have worked extensively with property services company ASW Property Services to ensure we maximise the community benefit contribution within this large contract. We have established a five year timetable together, which includes 100, 780 weeks of apprenticeship training and 50 weeks of work experience, tree planting, handy person services, supporting customers with IT and shopping, skip amenities, growing projects and education workshops. We currently have several Kickstart apprentices and we have joined the Kiffle Building Skills, a multi-award winning regional shared apprenticeship scheme that aims to provide a service which supports young adults into sustainable employment within the construction industry. Two of our new Kickstart apprentices have even been asked to appear on TV to discuss their experiences this Thursday. Very exciting. And we know we can do so much more together in partnership with others who share our community vision like ASW. We have worked with United Living to replace four community benches in Porth Call and Hale Construction to purchase and install a bus shelter for the residents of the rural community Hale Q. Plus WD Lewis developers to provide a new school playground for Porth Call Primary. This has gone down brilliantly at the start of the school year. When we visited the kids, who are always honest reviewers, they told us that it's great to have their own space, that it's so much neater and not slippery, and we love the fact that we can play football and our shoes stay dry. I'm sure that's their mum saying that, though. <laughs> another event that involved, oh, another event that involved and made children happy was this week's Magnificent Meadows event, where pupils from Porth Call Primary Many who live in Valley to Coast homes near the school spent the afternoon raking and sowing native wildflowers under the guidance of Plant Life Club Cymru. This is another great example of successful partnership working for our community with lottery funding and you guys at BCBC supporting too. Even the local member of the Senate, Sarah Murphy, joined in and got her hands dirty. And with the meadows nestling between the school and the estates, the kids will watch their flowers grow, which has so many long term benefits for our community. And this is very much in line with our vision for the greening of our communities. We've also worked with SERS Limited to support the relocation of the Bridge End Food Bank, which in current times is so sadly needed in our communities. And it has helped 5,669 residents since the start of the pandemic. And I could go on. But it's really important that we start looking forward amongst many of the projects we will be working on collaborate we'll, we, we will be working on we'll be working collaboratively with link cymru and their sunnyside bridge end developing by development 
by joining forces to develop a community garden next to the Westwood Community Centre in Kevin Glass. And we will be developing our social impact and value policy next year, which will enable us to capture and measure the impact and value of our community benefits is having for our customers and the communities. On community engagement, even, the pandemic limita even with the pandemic limitations, we have had some fantastic projects this year including involving our communities in the naming of our new homes, like in Kevin Kribur, where 65 suggestions came from the local community and we submitted the most meaningful three to you guys at BCBC and Klaus St. Johan was chosen. To find out the reasons why, read our news article on our website or on one of our social media channels. Or buy me a drink and I'll tell you. <laughs> The children at Oldcast Primary have helped with the naming of a new block of homes at Aweni Road at T. Modrion and uh, created these gorgeous hoarding paintings to cover the building site in the most attractive way. Please excuse my Welsh pronunciation, I'm only a Welsh learner, I'm giving it a go. Um, we regularly walk around our estates to speak to our customers. This includes all areas of business, including the leadership team. Um, in fact, we're going this Friday with board members and local politicians. Um, some of you might be coming along too. And it's so important to know what issues are affecting the people living in our homes and the people in communities know who we are. After restrictions lifted this summer, we focused on wild milled walkabouts to address the issues that had exacerbated over COVID lockdowns from grass cutting to rubbish. We sent out a survey and met many people face to face to hear concerns. Through working in partnership with BCBC colleagues and councillors, we have been developing solutions to the issues raised. We've had direct results and we're delighted to read in newsfromwales.co.uk yesterday, the councillors and residents are seeing results too. Our estate teams are currently developing an action plan, which will include how we will work with partners and the community to achieve some of these ideas. As we come out of COVID and it's safe to do so, we're also visiting our sheltered schemes to chat with residents and find out what it is like to live there and any changes they would like to see. In It's their homes and they are the experts. So we plan to use this knowledge to shape future plans. This is helping us also be informed partners as we work with BCBCs on your older person strategies. And while we've had a lot of success with our digital engagement through the pandemic that we want to keep going, we've missed getting out and about. Um, and this final slide shows our consultation van named, named in a customer cons cons competition as Reggie who, as Joe has already mentioned, goes out into our community and engages directly with customers so we can find out how they want to engage and interact with them in the future. It's also a way to meet and give information face-to-face -to, -face to customers who are not online. So thank you very much for listening to me and I shall hand you back over to Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Emma. Thank you, Emma. I've tried turning my camera on, so I'm hoping you can still hear me. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. So uh, the last time um, we came to the council meeting, we ran through with you our thinking on our corporate um, strategy. And some of you may know that we've now since launched it. And I want to thank you to members who contributed to the consultation. But I just thought I just want to show you a very brief now video on our corporate strategy. This is the final version that we are being launching um, online, but this is a bit of a premiere of a video and um, there's still uh, some final tweaks. So we just want to show it to you before we just uh, launch the final video explaining how our 10 year vision is going. This last year continues to be a challenge for customers, colleagues and everyone across our communities due to the pandemic. But at Valleys to Coast, we have taken this as an opportunity to refresh our 10-year corporate strategy to help deliver our purpose and our vision. We have been listening to what our customers are saying and we are acting on it. This 
safe haven. When I shut the door, I feel safe. Could you check up on tenants a bit more to see if they have any worries or problems? When things are good, they are very good. Listen to us tenants. Resolve our problems and repairs in a timely manner to make us feel safe and happy in our homes. We have split our strategic priorities into three phases. Foundation phase. We will be a brilliant landlord, providing homes where people feel safe and happy. Build phase. We will be a placemaker, building sustainable homes and thriving communities. Grow phase. We will play our part in the regeneration of Bridgend, the area we operate in. Its priorities are designed to help the organisation lay the solid foundations we need to be brilliant and then grow. And the focus of everything we do will always be committed to creating safe and happy customers, safe and happy homes. Safe and happy places and safe and happy colleagues. To find out more about our 10-year strategy, visit our website www.valleystocoast.wales. Okay, moving forward, sustainability is a key theme for us running throughout the business. And that's from putting nesting boxes in our estates to bring bird life back to our communities and ensuring our homes, our office and our depot are carbon neutral by 2030. And we've already made huge strides by moving our IT systems into the cloud and our barn house eco homes in Mardless. And we're already committed to changing our fleet of vehicles to electric. Now, this is part of our vision to help build a better Bridgend and a better Wales and we really believe passionately in supporting our local community and we strive to create strong and meaningful relationships with our local organisations to help regenerate Bridgend. Um, we continue to work with local suppliers and contractors to wherever possible to maximise the impact of our investments within the local community. And then we really want to ensure more now than ever as we're seeing the importance of paying suppliers on time and that we're fair and transparent in our procurement and tendering processes to ensure that we're delivering true value for our customers. But for our organisation to reach its potential, it's really important our colleagues need to feel safe and happy too. And after spending so much time working from home, the corporate strategy is also a guide for our colleagues' working behaviour as they return back to the office or the depot or back out in our communities. You know, after what's been a really challenging and difficult year, we're determined to take the positives. You know, there has been some positives and we've engaged an external consultancy to look at our future ways of working um, by giving our colleagues flexibility and choice on where and how they can work so that we can work smarter, which will be beneficial to the organisation and what we want to achieve. But even though this tricky period um, we have tried to continue to be a vibrant organisation to deliver quality homes and services for our customers. So our finance team recently were commended as finance team of the year category at the Finance Wales Award for their work this year um, through the pandemic. And also our development team uh, continues to go from strength to strength. And I just want to hand over now to um, Darren, our Corporate Director of Development, who can just give you a, a tell you now what we've been doing as part of our development programme. I'm hoping Darren's online. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you, Joe. Um, yeah, good afternoon. So, so as Joe's mentioned, uh, my name is Darren Davis. I'm the Corporate Director of Development and Growth with Valleys to Coast. And I'm uh, currently also providing some interim leadership on our turnaround program, which Joe has mentioned earlier. Um, I'll talk to you this afternoon about our new homes program. But I think it's, you know, we'll always ensure there's a focus of attention on our existing homes. I think it's really important for me to mention this afternoon because there is some some glamour, if you like, in the new homes program. But I think that our existing homes, you know, it will always be a major focus of attention for us. 
Before I talk you through the new homes we have in the pipeline, I wanted to say that uh, with so many families in Bridge End without their home and a national housing crisis, we have our Valleys to Coast are committed to building as many homes as we can within Bridge End. And to do so, we acknowledge the essential partnership that exists between the local authority and Valleys to Coast, for which today's session helps to build and strengthen that partnership between the two organisations. I'm really proud to report that uh, even in the, the, the lockdown period, the last uh, 12 to 15 months, our development team, to, together with local contractors, have completed 40 new homes, which include four homes in uh, uh, the North Canelli. Uh, it's the Barnos Pilot, as we call it, uh, class capital e -pill. Uh The 23 homes, again, in North Canelli, uh, in the Isle of Bryn uh, area, and 13 homes in Halo Coo. Um, the, the last scheme, I'm very proud to say, was the first land acquisition that I led on with the local authority back in 2018. So a real special scheme for me to, to be handing over recently. Just building uh, homes uh, for me and for us isn't good enough. Um, all of our development schemes will deliver innovative, desirable and affordable housing in the Bridge End town centre and the surrounding communities as well as gener generating local jobs and income, which we can reinvest into the maintenance improvement of our homes. Emma and Joe have, have both talked about uh, the range of community benefits that, uh, that we have been able to deliver, many of which have come from our new homes program. So it's, it's important for me to say that uh, whilst our new homes provide new homes, uh, they, they contribute much wider to uh, the community, as, as uh, Emma has explained and, and demonstrated today. So. With this in mind, uh, as we're the only Bridgend based housing association, uh, any grant that uh, the local authorities support us in gaining, whether that's the social housing grant or the transforming towns grant from the Welsh Government, the, the money will go towards the building, of course, in new homes, but also investing in the wider community. One of the uh, projects I'm most excited about is our Ford Riglois scheme in North Canelli. Uh, it's due to be finished within the next month or so. Not only will this scheme provide homes to customers who are currently without a home, uh, the ho the, those homes will have been built uh, in, a, in a way which is the first of its kind in Wales. Uh, the homes will be built from a lightweight, innovative structural insulated panel system, which eliminates for the need for wet trades and makes the homes more energy efficiency, e efficient for the customers. Uh, it means that they're being more affordable for the customers and quicker to build. Whilst I say that, although there has been some teething problems uh, from being the first such build in Wales, and we've suffered from some COVID Brexit supply issues, I'm, I'm sorry to bring both those terms into this afternoon's presentation, um, whether whether it's by us or by uh, another housing association, uh, you know, we, we are uh, reassured now that uh, the homes built from such a style will take uh, about 12 weeks from above ground to, to build, which is a much quicker period and will help to reduce the, the housing crisis that we have within Wales. So, so with that introduction, um, I hope you'll understand why the development of new homes is a key part to our 10 year corporate strategy. And I'd like to take the opportunity to just to talk you through a few of our schemes, if I may. And uh, there are some lovely pictures which, which support what I'm going to take you through. So first one is for the rig on the screen. I've touched on that one in terms of the uh, innovative panel build but as you'll see from that picture um, they are one bedroom homes so they're not one bedroom flats the one bedroom homes is a real special opportunity for us because it allows the customers to have some privacy of space and some private space in front and rear gardens as it were and what you'll also see there on the on the rooftop are this the solar pv panels and and the construction and those additional add-ons the solar pvs will help to make them a very very energy efficient home for the customers um, just for information, the, the social housing grant that was awarded for that scheme is around about £420,000 and the, the build cost is, is about £900,000. So taking us a bit longer, but we, we're close now to coming to completion and uh, we'll be very pleased to hand that over and see those, those customers moving into that scheme. The next one I'd like to touch upon is this scheme uh, that we currently call My Stay Road in Tondi. Um, so it's a proposed mix on that, of the proposed housing within that will be 10 uh, one bedroom flats. Um, it's again, social housing grant is just over 700,000 pounds with about around about 1.5 million pounds build. Um, so it's it's uh, the former bakery in Tondi. So currently it, you know, it was a previously a, quite a, an unkempt site. So we've been able to secure that with a, a local developer uh, and we do to complete those homes with a, by about April, um, sorry, April, 2022. 
Um, so again, a local developer as a package deal, very proud to be delivering those one bedroom homes in Tondi. The next scheme is in the town centre, so uh, in Iweni Roads. So this is a refurbishment, a mainly refurbishment scheme with some new build on the rear. Uh, so it will provide seven one bedroom uh, flats within the, the Bridge End area. Uh, the social housing grant is just over £560,000, and, and again, it's around about a £900,000 build. We, we're aiming to complete that scheme by about March 2022. And for those that will recognise that, that building was an, an old, old motorbike uh, showroom and workshop. And uh, it's great that we can you know, uh, bring such a building back into use. And we hope that that will be an attractive uh, alternative to the existing provision and also providing essential homes. The the next one, uh, we move down to Porth Call. Uh, so this, uh, for all the members that might be aware of the scheme, is the old Scouts Hall site uh, on Wooden Avenue. So uh, really, really interesting scheme this because the, uh, the, the Scouts were in occupation for many years in a building that was, was becoming uh, unfit for use and, and unsafe for use. So we worked uh, in collaboration with the Scouts Hut group and we were able to provide them with alternative location just uh, a little bit further up Woodland Avenue in the Gilgal Church. And, and we refurbished that church uh, prior to the moving in. So they now have a very much more secure, much more safe, much more clean and friendly accommodation for the Scouts service. And that freed up this site to allow us to provide 10 new homes that's four one-bedroom flats and six two-bedroom houses, currently being developed by uh, Hale Construction, uh, a Neath-based company. Uh, the social housing grant for that scheme is, is about one and a half million, and it's about a two and a half million pounds bill. So again, looking to complete that within the next uh, 10 months or so. And uh, again, an, an essential scheme in a, in a location in Porth Gaul where formerly it was really an unused uh, site. Next scheme for me just to tell you a little bit about is the one in Waterton. Uh, we call it the Bro on Broadcastle Avenue. So that's uh, a really challenging scheme for us. Uh, with this one uh, has been with us since about 2017. Um, unfortunately, we, we had to terminate the contract with the original developer and we worked really, really hard and very, very closely with the planners in the local authority to ensure that we can deliver a no home scheme in the Waterton area. So the plan is to build six two-bedroom flats, uh, one four-bedroom house and 18 two-bedroom houses. Um, there's a, a, a social housing grant allocation of about 2.4 million and it's, a, it's over four million pounds billed. So it's, it's an 18 month uh, contract period. We're just about to go on site next week with that one. So after many years of really, really hard work, the team has started to, to develop that site. So, so, so for those that may not know it, it's the location of the, uh, the, the former Model T pub uh, just alongside the Starbucks um, coffee shop. So uh, it's going to be a really attractive linear site uh, and, and in due course, the potential is for the access into that scheme to form the access into the estate behind. So really proud of that one after so many years of hard, hard, hard effort from the team. Next scheme for me to touch upon is, is up in the Park Duran estate. Uh, this is a section 106 scheme that we have in partnership with Persimmon. So uh, again, there has been very limited numbers of uh, affordable and social rented homes in Park Duran. So we have secured seven low cost home ownership homes, uh, which we will be marketing very soon. So they will be homes at 70% of market value. So that will make them affordable for local people to, to acquire. Uh, there will be 12 number one bedroom flats and for two bedroom flats. Uh, those 16 flats will be social rented flats. So uh, again, a, a challenging uh, uh, negotiation scheme with Persimmon, um, but we are anticipating the handover of the uh, homes in the next, uh, in, the, in the coming months. And then the flats will be probably about 10 months from now. So really proud to be delivering a scheme in the Park Duran estate area. So just want that, that those are the schemes I wanted to, to describe and explain to you. They're the ones that we have on site at the moment. Moving on to um, the, sorry, I'm not, the slides aren't keeping up to date with where I am. So I'm just going to move myself on. So moving on to the social housing grant program, which I've talked about uh, on each scheme. Um, again, with the working relationship with, with Lynn Berry as strategic housing officer in the local authority, we're really proud that 
the, the current year uh, PDP, as we call it, the program delivery plan. So that's the plan that we agree with the local authority on the schemes that we will deliver with social housing grant support. The, we have now secured over nearly 16 million pounds with grant over the next few years uh, on the main program. So those are the schemes that we will certainly deliver. We have uh, over 4 million in the what's called the reserve uh, pipeline of schemes. So that's uh, schemes that are, are waiting to be delivered subject to grant becoming available. Um, and, and if grant becomes available through slippage or additional grant, those schemes will move on to site. And then we have over 12 million pounds in what we call the potential aspect of the PDP. And that's those schemes that we are working on, which have strategic support, but are a little bit further down in the development process. So, you know, that's over 32 million pounds worth of grant uh, schemes that we have within the PDB. So from a position uh, four years ago where Valley to Coast had probably less than 10% of the grant allocation uh, for Bridgen, we, we're now in excess of 50% of grant allocation. And whilst that's great for building homes, as I've said, throughout this session, that will also provide a huge range of community benefits for Bridge End. So um, just to touch upon some of the schemes that are in the future pipeline. So uh, there's a list there for everybody to see. Uh, there's 24 homes in Pencoid. Um, there are 20 homes in Porth Coal. Uh, there are six homes in Oxford Court in the Ogmore Vale. And, and what you'll see on that slide in front of you is, is a couple of schemes now which are within the valley areas or above the M4 line. And I think that's been an aspiration of ours as a, as a housing association, not just to develop in those areas where I, I suppose it's been traditional for housing associations over the last few years to build south of the M4. We are now working very closely as a strategic partner with Bridgen to start building in those areas, in the valley areas, and you know, we're proud to, to include some of those screens, schemes on the site. Um, also, you'll see uh, at the bottom of that slide, there are three schemes in the town centre, Sunnyside House, Noton Arcade, and the Sachs uh, nightclub uh, in the, on Noton uh, Street. Uh, and again, those schemes are very much aligned to the town centre master plan and the, the revised LDP that uh, is, is coming to the end of its, um, um, its consultation period. So hopefully you'll see from that slide that we're working very closely to deliver housing uh, aligned to the need, but also housing to support other strategic, strategic priorities of the local authority. So uh, onto the last slide for me and uh, the slide uh, which uh, is on the screen, hopefully for you all, which is a Mars scheme school project. Again, really, really exciting project for us and hopefully an exciting project for the local authority, whereby we are swapping land between the two organisations. So land that we have uh, on the Marlis estate in North Canelli uh, will be a location for a new uh, school as part of the school's modernisation programme. And, and in return for that, the local authority will swap to us uh, the Avon and Avellin uh, school site, which is quite local to this, and also the Glanor Avon site over in Saan. So that will allow us to, to provide circa 90 new homes in those other areas, in areas of high demand uh, where there is strategic support. And this then frees up this site for the local authority to build a school. And I think the potential of this modern, modern um, high standard school in the, this estate will, will absolutely drive uh, a regeneration piece within the, the locality for us. So again, you know, I will say a personal thank you to the colleagues within the local authority on behalf of the, the, uh, the association for, for engaging us and supporting us to deliver that project. So that's it for me. Um, I'm gonna hand you back now to Joe, uh, who will take you through to the Anna report and the remainder of the presentation. Great. Thank you, Darren. You know, it's really exciting to see these schemes come into fruition and our contribution to develop much needed homes in Bridgend. But, you know, as Darren said, our focus is still on our existing homes and services. And at the end of the financial year, 81% of our customers reported they were satisfied with the service from Valleys to Coast. You know, and that's pretty good, but we know we can and we will be doing better next year when we come back to report where we are with some of our end of year performance. We have our AGM around the corner 
Um, and our board um, continues to be one of oversight. It's fully embraced virtual working um, and it, it, that has really allowed the important role of scrutiny to be maintained. You know, as a leadership team, we keep the board informed of the ongoing financial and operational performance of the business and we're really working closely with them. We're currently recruiting for some new board members, which will bring some well needed skills into the organisation, ranging from equality, diversity and inclusion to digital and IT and human resources. Um, as you know, I joined the organisation now about 18 months ago and um, restructured the leadership team and working with the board um, to ensure that um, Valleys to Coast was equipped and able to deliver the new corporate strategy objectives. And it is this team that's making these changes and improvements to really set up now for us for next year. So to finish off, I just thought I would give you, you know, final video from us, a, a sneak peek of our year in review video that we're going to be premiering at our AGM next week. So enjoy. Over the last year, we have achieved great things as an organisation, taking strides towards our commitment to ensure that our customers, homes, places and colleagues are safe and happy. At Valleys to Coast, our customers are at the heart of everything we do. Our money matters and Welsh water teams have been working hard generating an additional £1.62 million in added value for our customers and supporting 119 families with emergency food bank parcels. After over a year of self-isolating, the community living team at our sheltered and extra care schemes has supported residents to regain the strong sense of community that existed pre-pandemic celebrating the Llistorn restaurant reopening and even celebrating Christmas in July. As restrictions get lifted, we've been able to, to start to really rejuvenate the well-being aspect of tenancy management. Um, and that's something we've rolled out across all of our schemes. So what we've done is we've put in structured well-being plans, which um, we've done in consultation with the tenants, um, with the um, aim of ensuring that they not only get to see and be part of a community, but they are happier, they are healthier, um, and as such are able to look at their homes as happy homes and to be happier customers. Our hub has also been on hand to support customers with their queries, helping over 1,800 customers between April 2020 and March 2021 through social media messaging and our web chat service alone. By the end of the financial year, over 81% of customers reported they were satisfied with the service from valleys to coast. Our total number of lets from April 2020 to March 2021 was 273. We are also committed to regenerating Bridgend by building safe and desirable homes where people can feel proud to live. We've delivered 40 new homes across Bridgend, including our development built at Hale Q, built as part of Bridgend County Borough Council's school modernisation programme. We worked with a local architect, Spring Design, to help us design a scheme which we felt would fit into the community and add value to the community in terms of good quality homes. One of the things we, we endeavoured to do was to recognise the history of the school by maintaining the plaque which you see over my shoulder. And what we've done that is to build that into the end of the community as a gesture to show, I suppose, the, the history of the site. We have also secured £15.8 million in social housing grant funding from the Welsh Government, all of which will go towards us achieving our corporate plan objective of delivering 100 new homes on average in Bridgend each year. To ensure our existing homes remain safe and happy, we have invested £9.1 million in planned repairs and improvements, an increase of £2.2 .2 million from last year, completing a total of 16,950 repairs. Our major improvements works team have delivered 59 new kitchens, 14 new bathrooms, 
and installed 43 new boilers for our customers. We want to be placemakers and ensure that our communities are thriving. Our partnerships are key in helping us to achieve this. That's why we've been working closely with partners such as Keep Wales Tidy and Plant Life Cymru to create clean and attractive spaces where our customers are proud to live. Through our Community Benefits Programme, we have facilitated the delivery of various improvements throughout Bridgend with our contractors, including installing new benches at Putla Wine with United Living, supporting the relocation of Bridgend Food Bank with SIRS, and delivering a new schoolyard for a local primary school. We recognise our responsibility to reduce our impact and create safe and happy places in Bridgend which is why we have also partnered with Bridgend County Borough Council and Bridgend College in an ambitious scheme to plant 60,000 trees and are undertaking ecology surveys of our green spaces to ensure that we put the right trees in the right places. Our colleagues are what makes Valleys to Coast brilliant, so we've been working hard to ensure that we recruit the best people and nurture their development to make Valleys to Coast a great place to work. With the pandemic changing the way we have worked over the last year, we opened the conversation up with colleagues to find out what worked for them, what lessons they learned, and what modes of working they would like to take forwards as we look beyond the pandemic. This is our Future Ways of Working consultation. We have also employed two apprentices under the government's Kickstart scheme. The Kickstart scheme itself is a six month uh, funded placement. Um, and we are supporting them up to 37 hours um, a week. Um, they'll also be gaining some minor qualifications alongside that then. But what our real hope is, is to um, then go on to a full two year um, apprenticeship with us and there's lots of enthusiasm there which is a um, really nice feeling. We'll be part of the coaching and mentoring of their process throughout the next six months. We'll be far more employable than what they are at the moment, making sure that they get lots of experience and lots of understanding and developing their skills. We are proud of the work we've achieved over the last year, despite the ongoing challenges presented by the pandemic. With the lessons we've learned throughout the lockdown over the last 18 months, along with our newly launched corporate strategy guiding us through until 2031, we are certain that next year will be even better. Yeah, I, I apologise for such a long presentation and then a number of videos, and I know some of you would have already engaged and seen elements of this, but I thought you know, despite the challenges of um, last year, it has been a busy year for us and I really wanted to give you a proper rounded update of what we've been doing over the last um, 12 months. So I would just now like to open the floor to any questions um, that you would like to, the opportunity for myself, Darren and Emma and Sarah being here. Thank you, George. For the great content there, and members will have questions, I'm sure. And I just thank you from Valleys to Coast, our PUC, and your team, um, especially the greening communities. If there's anything going on that you'd like to invite me to, I'd be happy to plant trees or help out with anything to do with the environment. Please give me a shout. So, will do, thank you. We, uh, <laughs> members are going to ask questions first. One is Councillor Jane Gabby. Councillor Gabby, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, hi Joe. firstly can I thank your team for um, an excellent presentation and a, a really good update of your business model and I was really pleased to hear you make reference to social value but as I'm sure you're aware our council have declared a climate emergency and Welsh Government have stated that any organisations receiving public funds need to show due regard to the net zero strategy due to be implemented by 2030. So what measures have been taken by Valleys to Coast with regard to retrofitting your housing stock, please, and ensuring that energy efficiency upgrades are completed? Yeah, OK, I'll, I'll introduce and then I'll ask Darren to come in because we've done, you know, as we've said in our corporate strategy, a full commitment to not just, you know, decarbonisation of our homes, but us as an organisation by 2030. And we've engaged with 
Colonel Cymru and Carbon Trust to do an exercise for us to really understand our carbon footprint so that we've got that real strong baseline to put together in terms of our um, action plan of what we need to take forward for our own sustainability agenda. But we've also been involved as part of a number of initiatives with Welsh Government to do with um, retrofit. So I'll bring Darren in, who can just talk through some of the detail of the programmes and the initiatives we're delivering on. Hi, Councillor Gerby, thanks for the question. Um, hopefully I'm clear to you. I put this camera on so I can see you as well. You can see me. So, yeah, looking back with Valley Sugars, you've got to remember that, you know, there's been some good things happening in the past. Uh, so uh, there would have been the old Arbit Bed programme. So that would have been a Welsh government funded programme whereby uh, Valley Sugars has previously uh, improved the energy efficiency of homes with uh, external wall insulation and, and solar PV and solar thermal in, uh, systems. Um, so there's been some very good work in the past, but of course, there's a huge job ahead of us in terms of decarbonizing our homes. So as Joe's mentioned, we, we've, we're we part of a collaborative uh, uh, group that's working very closely. And we, we are, I'd say, one of the lead organizations working with Welsh Government on the Optimised Retrofit Programme, which is uh, advising and guiding, guiding Wales, both Welsh Government and the RSLs generally, on what is the best way to improve the energy efficiency of homes. So, so with that in mind, what we are doing is undertaking surveys of our existing homes to understand what is the best way to improve the energy efficiency of those homes, not just to achieve a, a higher energy rating, but also to ensure that the customers benefit as a result of that work, because it would be very easy for an organisation to move towards electrifying our uh, heating and, and uh, systems within the homes but that wouldn't provide the customers currently with the best solution in terms of the cost in their pocket so what we are doing Councillor Gabby is working up a program of works that we will then seek to deliver with support from all us coming in terms of grant funding between now and 2030. So some fantastic practice in the past. We are delivering some programs of work currently through the Optimised Retro Pro Fit Programme for which we had funding, and we are building new plans for the future. Thank you, Darren. Um, Gabby, okay with that? Um, so I am to a certain degree, but I'd actually really like to know how many of your residents are living in pure fuel poverty because we, we often see those that are most more vulnerable living in social housing. And if we're not retrofitting their properties, that means the cost of living is going up exponentially year on year, day on day. And Octopus, one of the cheapest suppliers around, have just announced an increase today. So I think it's vitally important that we do something about it. Thank you very much both. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. And it's part of our strategy to make sure we focus on the, the most important homes first. Okay, thank you, Dad. Thank you, Joe. Um, Councillor Amanda Williams next. Hi, thanks very much. Apologies, I've got uh, system issues today. So um, the presentation was a bit uh, jumpy for me. Um, you said about the houses in Park Derwin and the flats and that there would be 16 um, socially rented flats available probably in about 10 months from now. And then there were the seven homes. Um, I didn't catch when you said those homes would be ready. And I just wanted confirmation that the um, socially rented flats would be uh, allocated as per BC BC's waiting list. Thanks very much. Hi, Councillor William. So um, there's a, a little bit of a staggered approach on the seven. So there'll be two in the next couple of months coming over. Then the other five will probably be closer to Christmas, if maybe just after Christmas. So that are the low cost home ownership homes. So as I said, they'll be at 70% of market value and we we are starting to market those homes now. The 16 homes, uh, which will be the social rent, will most certainly be uh, let on the same basis that we let other homes uh, within Bridge End. Okay, Councillor Williams. Yes, thank you. No. Okay, next. Uh, we get Councillor Keith Edwards. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, once again, thank you for the presentation. Safe and happy homes, uh, a wonderful aspiration. Uh, unfortunately, uh, many of our communities and many of our 
valleys to coast communities are blighted by antisocial behaviour on a scale which is totally unacceptable and which is causing major conflicts between uh, some of the residents on many of our estates. Can you tell, tell me please what your strategies are for dealing with continual uh, antisocial behaviour where there's police involvement over a long period of time? Thank you. I think this one is 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 mine to take. Hello, and, and thank you for that question. I think that um, you know antisocial behaviour can be a very significant issue in a number of communities, and certainly sort of like lockdown and COVID hasn't helped that situation because there has been, uh, with everybody ourselves included, a sort of like a rollback of services, and people haven't been in contact with people as they. Um, as they would have done um, sort of like prior to the COVID pandemic. But we certainly do work with a number of agencies. So we work closely with BCBC um, in partnership with them. We've got, we regularly meet with the police. We're on all the sort of strategic police boards and um, the offender management work that's being done. Um, so we do work very closely with, with all the partners. We can always do more and do better. So, um, as I say, we've been out in the communities quite recently, recently talking to people, making ourselves known so that people feel um, comfortable uh, sort of talking to us and reporting issues to us and to the police so that we can sort of start working together. But we've had a number of joint operations with the police. We've had um, we've got more than one legal proceedings in place to try and um, remedy some extreme issues of antisocial behaviour. And then we're just also out about in the community, taking reports of what's happening and engaging with customers. We um, work with the, the sort of central support agency in BCBC to make sure people are getting the right support. So when antisocial behaviour is being caused by things like mental health crises, we have multi-agency meetings with social services. So we try to be very bespoke um, around the sort of solutions around antisocial behaviours because the, you know, the causes of it are as long as a piece of string and, and so, are the, so are the remedies to that. Um, and again, I think like, like everybody, I think we are facing um, like an increase in, in issues because of the situations that people have been in, sadly. Hey, Edwards. Yeah, th thanks for that. That's um, that's encouraging, but unfortunately, uh, we're not experiencing that uh, on the ground. I, I have many residents contacting me uh, regarding neighbours who were partying all night long, um, causing all sorts of problems, and little seems to be done about it. So. I just hope that going forward we, we can remedy these remedy these issues. Thank you. Okay, so I mean, just outside the so outside this meeting, if you if you if you if you call through the sort of like addresses of the properties where you're experiencing issues, we will obviously look into any sort of specific circumstances to make sure that we have taken all action that we can. Okay, thanks for that. Now we've got three more speakers, and I, and I bring a I draw a line in with that. We got Councillor Tim Thomas, Councillor Malcolm James. Councillor Mike, Mike Clark, because uh, we have got a long agenda and we do need to move on to other items. So, Councillor Tim Thomas next. Yeah, thanks. Thanks all. Um, very interested in your uh, customer engagement. Um, I'm just wondering, um, well, I, I, I found some data the other day which alarmed me, which revealed that it was from Age Cymru, uh, which revealed that my Unisoudra board is, is one of the loneliest uh, um, wards in Bridgend County and some of the loneliest in Wales. Um, we've got a fair proportion of older people and a fair proportion of valleys to coast properties there. I'm just wondering, I'm quite interested in your community engagement. It's, it's very high tech. I'm just wondering, what are you doing to um, engage with some of the harder to reach tenants, such as older people? And also from my mailbox, if you like, I'm, getting a, I'm get, noting more and more uh, casework, which is mental health related, and I and respect the fact that your resources are dwindling. I'm just wondering what you're doing to support those uh, tenants with um, mental health problems as well. Thanks. So, um, yes, it's uh, engaging with those harder to reach has become harder again, I think, again, in, in, in the pandemic. So while we've seen quite a lot of 
success with our digital engagement and probably more than we were expecting it does mean that there is a population and a lot of that is the older population um, who have been harder to reach so through covid we've been ringing people um, and um, identifying our older residents and giving them a call um, and you know asking them if they'd like us to call more regularly and trying to make sure that we can do that and as as, as i've said reggie is now back out and about which means we're back out and about um, so we're hoping to, we've done our first round of consultation, trying to just a really open consultation, just to find out what people want and what people want from us. Um, and that's still going on and then we'll be doing a second round around, around rents, but we do pick up all sorts of issues um, when we're out and about in the community and we make sure that we try to, you know, refer into services as well. So in relation to older people specifically, we are um, a part funder of care and repair um, and support that organization. So where there are older people, there's a lot of support that comes from that organization um, who link into sort of like different services. So we do try try our best around, around those things and more and more as we get more out and about, we'll be able to help with that. Um, in relation to sort of like mental health, it's a very, very tricky issue. Um, lots of people in lots of communities in our homes and not in our homes experience mental health issues. And again, you know, made worse by the, the sort of COVID pandemic. We're linked in again to all the agencies. So where we come across people with mental health issues, we try and make sure that where there is support available, that we are linking people into it. Everything from um, sort of like more kind of casual sort of like community connectors um, all the way up to sort of like complex multi-agency meetings for people with very serious issues um, and everything in between. Um, but there is a huge, um, almost overwhelming amount of mental health issues out there and probably not enough services to cover it all. However, when we are talking to services, that is probably one of the main issues about how we can make be more joined up um, and make the most of what we all have for that particular issue. But there are no easy solutions out there for that one, I'm afraid. Okay, thank you, Emma. Thanks for that. Um, Councilor Malcolm James next. Hi, Joe. It's Councilor Malcolm James. Um, there are individual things which we can't talk about, all right? I mean, some of the things I could talk about would be an embarrassment to you, right? Um, tenants come to us as councillors as a, as a last resort sometimes, okay? But when we email into you, they didn't have the decency to get back to us half the time. We feel I'm, I'm, a, I'm a complaints machine for values to coast, and I don't seem to be getting anywhere, Joe. When you talk about partnerships, I just hope you go back, all right? And when we email into you with a complaint, a little bit more notice is taken of our complaints, because I seem to be getting nowhere with them. Uh, Thank you. I'm sorry to hear that because one of the focuses as part of our turnaround is to be is on the complaints process. Um, outside of this, if you want to just give drop us an email of those specifics and we'll look at it because we have been working closely with the members referral system to improve that system and making sure we're responding in a much more timely um, manner to both customers and to the referrals that come through from councillors. So, just drop us an email and we'll pick some of those cases up um, yeah. outside of this. Is that okay? Yeah, you know, an update would be fine. At least tell tell us what you're doing and what's happening, all right? It keeps me in the dark. It keeps all the tenants in the dark. And they're not happy tenants, I can tell you that now. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor James. Communication is the key one, I think. Right. Uh, Councillor Mike Clark, next, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you for the, very much for the presentation. Um, obviously, um, most of the presentations have concentrated on new build and exciting things for the future. Um, and I say that um, uh, not being facetious. I, 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 I'm, I think that that looks very good. I'm particularly encouraged by um, what seems quite innovative to be looking at one bedroom homes as opposed to one bedroom flats. Uh, and I think that's, that, that is quite an interesting um, development. However, as I said earlier, um, uh, most of it is concentrated on, on new builds and new, new things that are being done. Um, can I ask you around older accommodation um, the, and that um, the repair backlog um, issues are not presenting um, tenants with any issues where 
um, their accommodation is not fit for purpose. And part of the reason for asking this is there's a lot in, in the news at the moment about other areas. So I'd like reassurance that uh, that within the Bridge End area, all of our tenants are living in, in um, property that is fit for purpose and recognising that there is a, uh, an inevitable repair backlog, um, that that is um, dealt with on a, on, on, if you like, a balanced emergency basis. Thank you. Yes, certainly. Um, we do do stock condition surveys, so I'll ask Darren to come in just so in terms you're aware of what we do on a on an annual basis in terms of assessing our properties. Yeah, thank you, Joe. Uh, hi, Councillor Clark, and, and thank you for the, the mention on the new build programme. But as I said in that presentation, the, the new build will always provide a small contribution to the number of homes in Bridge End when you recognise the, the, the 6,000 homes that we have already. So, you know, we do have a process of what we call stock condition surveys that allows us to inspect uh, about a fifth of our homes every year uh, that enables us to understand the condition of those homes of course at that point deal with any issues that we have to do but then also allows us to plan the future investments into a home so it allows us to plan for kitchen replacements bathroom replacements boiler replacements and so on so we do have a planned process in place which we're very proud of we, we also, of course, have a strong direct labour organisation, DLO. We have around 60 trades individuals that we employ directly that help us to repair and maintain our homes. And one of the benefits of having a direct labour organisation as opposed to all contracted is that extra pairs of eyes and ears that those colleagues provide to us when, when visiting our homes. So they don't go in and just fix a door because they've been told to fix the door. They go fix the door and, and have that watching brief. So if there are any issues, that gives us that extra heads up in terms of the condition of our homes. The other very important aspect of maintaining our homes is what we call compliance. So when I talk about compliance, I talk about things like gas safety, electrical safety, water safety, lift safety. And we have comprehensive programs in place to ensure the homes are kept safe with regards to statutory responsibilities um, so we, we, we deal with those, you know, some of that work in-house, we deal with some of that through contractors, but we have comprehensive programs to make sure our homes are safe. So, so with those programs in mind, from stock condition survey through to plan maintenance, through to compliance, and through the reactive repair service through our DLO, we have a good line of sight of our homes, and that helps us to ensure that they are in the best condition possible. Now, with having 5,800 homes, you know, that's a challenge to see everything. And that's why we do have a 24 hour, seven day a week, 365 day a year um, uh, availability service whereby customers, tenants and you know, representatives like councillors can report issues of disrepair to us, which we respond to accordingly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. OK, thank you uh, for that. And thank you, Joe. And every the Valleys to Coast team, some with um, content as I said earlier and uh, but I suppose there's many more questions probably members would like to ask but I think they can contact you direct with any any um, concerns you have because we, we do need to move on with the agenda um, you're welcome to stay but I'm not sure I think you've got other things to attend to so thanks again for that report and presentation and we'll, I'm sure we'll see you again in the future future sort of council meetings and presentations um, but thanks and all the best for your plans for the future yeah, thank you, Dio Cole. Thank you for listening. Yeah, please contact us outside of this meeting. And we also have our councillor engagement sessions on a quarterly basis, which we could pick up any future issues. So uh, thank you for allowing us to inviting us to stay. But I think we'll all uh, leave now and allow yeah. you to do your council business. Dio Cole, okay. thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, right. So we now uh, members move on to item five on the agenda. Um, the first one is announcements. Um, I'll try to be as quick as I can on my announcement because you know, we've got two, but there's been a while since the last meeting in July. So it gives me great pleasure to announce the names of this year's Youth Mayor and Deputy Youth Mayor. Youth Mayor will be Xander Payne from Archbishop McGrath Catholic High School. The Deputy Youth Mayor is G. Williams of the Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama. Both have been part of the Youth Council for a few years. G won a Diana Award for his transgender awareness training that helps with our YPOP LGBTQIA group. YPOP is the name of the youth 
LGBTQIA group, which stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, questioning, queer, intersex, asexual. And that's run on a min Monday evening from five to six, uh, and taking virtually at present. And Xander is also one of Progen's young ambassadors and is looking to stand as our Welsh, Welsh Youth Parliament representative. So we wish them both all the best for the coming year and their future ambitions. Also, like to congratulate Progen's very own Paralympic champion, Alad Sean Davis, for yet another successful Games and representing Progen and Wales on the world stage. Alad, Alad has won his third Paralympic gold medal, this time in the men's F63 shot put event at Tokyo was also a co-captain of the Great Britain Paralympic team. He's been a great ambassador for Bridgend and Paralympic sport, and that will now be looking towards Paris in three years' time. Alade is one of a long line of successful Bridgend-based Paralympians, who will, have no doubt, inspired future Paralympians also. So over, the la over the summer period, since our last meeting, I have the pleasure of attending a number of events, along with the 60th and 65th wedding anniversary, um, also, it's great to see the work taking place as part of our school holiday enrichment programme called SHEP at both Comfort Comprehensive and Colour Comedal, Comedal at Erwin and enjoyed having a school dinner with the children. And I've also joined with the leader and some local members. When it comes to school dinners, it was dinners for the leader, not just dinner. Um, I also attended Pencourt Library uh, for the launch of a Wales Cooperative Centre iPad loan scheme, which has been made available to carers in the county borough. Um, through Pajen Carers, a great scheme that and one that can be accessed via our libraries with our one. I also learned what a great online resource we now have at these at all our libraries with free access online to magazines, which I quickly signed up to because it's a marvellous resource which we could all use. At the end of August, I attended the annual Gilbertco Forestry Fundring along with the Mayor of RCT and it was well attended with numerous children taking part, medals presented to all that took part with trophies for those in first, second and place in three age categories. Yeah, there was a third, but only first and second were awarded, but in three age categories. And on 26th of August at 8.10 a.m., I attended the annual Park Slip Memorial Service, along with Mayor S, and it was a moving tribute to the 112 men and boys who lost their life in the dreadful explosion that took place in 1892 at Park Slip, which each and every one of the names being read out, with the leader being part of the group of people reading out the names in September, I started off the visit to Lanson Gardening Club, 50th anniversary celebrations, along with the leader, and it was great to see some sort of no normality returning with a wonderful display of flowers and vegetables and lovely cream tea was provided. Councillor Pam Davis was also in attendance, and all three of us ended up joining the Gardening Club as members. On Thursday, the 9th September last week, it was 999 Flag Day, and along with the leader and High Sheriff Miguel Morgan, we raised the flag at the civic offices in honour of the seven and a half thousand emergency workers who have lost their lives in the line of duty over the last hundred or so years and we held a two minute silence in honour of them. As for raising funds for the two groups I'm supporting, that's lads and dads uh, supporting Bridgen, uh, mental wellbeing, men's mental wellbeing and Bridgen Carer Centre. The mayor's tandem sky day was postponed due to weather in July and now scheduled to take place on 27th of November. Clear skies for it then. Not sure what chance there is with that, but fingers crossed, and if not, it'll then be rescheduled for March 2022. The mayoress will be jumping out of an airplane with a parachute. Many thanks to those who sponsored the Skydiver to date, and it's never too late to make a donation via the council website on the mayor's page. And I hope to soon be announcing a charity pre Christmas buffet evening at Bridgend Rugby Football Club at Brewery Field, where there'll be a buffet, a comedy hypnotist, along and music and entertainment at the end of November. Tickets will soon be available. Um, lastly, I'd like to draw attention to item of business. It's been requested the meeting of subject over your scrutiny three, scheduled for Wednesday, the 29th September 21, be moved to Monday, the 4th of October 21. The agreement of the chair, this has been actioned, and a new calendar appointment has been sent, and members are therefore asked to note the change. Lastly, and to end on a positive note, I'd like to congratulate Councillor Charlotte Green and her husband Tom celebrating their golden wind anniversary recently. We all pass our best wishes on reaching this impressive milestone. And also it comes to Stephen Smith and his partner Gemma. I say congratulations on your marriage at the weekend just past and wish you all the very best for a long and happy future together. That's the end of my little piece and I'm going to move on to 
Members of the cabinet, please. Councillor, oh, the deputy leader first. Councillor Williams. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, as you know, Bridgen County Borough already has one of the highest recycling rates in Wales. And we quickly rose from 46% back in 2010 to our current steady 69%. Now, latest figures have revealed that more than 155,000 tonnes of waste have been recycled and div diverted away from landfill over the last four years. Within that figure is just over 26,000 tonnes of paper and card, 17,500 tonnes of glass, 12,000 tonnes of plastic, 7,700 tonnes of metal, and 3,700 tonnes of electrical waste. To help you visualise that, I'm told that this is the equivalent weight of 26,000 elephants. And on average, each person have generated 856 kilograms of waste during the four year period. The purple bag scheme has recycled more than 4,350 tonnes and has converted cellulose fibres into fibre boards and acoustic panelling. While the 32,000 tonnes of food have been converted into electricity to power local communities and produce the soil enhancer. Our Cleaner Streets team have cleared just over 4,000 tonnes of fly tip waste, while more than 3,200 tonnes of garden waste have been taken away for composting. I'm sure you will agree that these are highly impressive figures and with final preparations also underway for the opening of the new Community Recycling Centre of Pyle, they are set to rise even higher. Especially now that we have a new contractor in place to recycle the collected uh, litter from uh, public litter bins. I would like to thank everyone who has helped to make this such a success, but especially the Kia collectors to keep the service running and walking behind, walking between seven to ten miles a day, carrying up to four tons of waste, and our local residents who have made such a fantastic effort for recycling. I'd also like to remind members that next Monday we'll see the launch of our annual budget consultation, where we will once more be inviting local residents to help us to develop spending priorities for the. 2022 to 2023. This time the budget consultation will focus upon a longer term vision for the county borough while still covering traditional areas such as investment in schools, roads, regeneration projects, energy schemes, council tax levels, support for businesses, tourism and the economy and how online services might be developed further. The annual budget consultation forms an important element in our efforts to deliver effective and efficient services as a right for our communities. And I'm sure that members will want to encourage constituents to take part and have their say. The consultation will be available in a variety of formats and the deadline for responses will be the 14th of November 2021. Further details will be available soon, including the consultation page on the corporate website. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Leader. Um, next cabinet member for communities, Councillor Stuart Baldwin. Thank you, Mr. May. I've got a few short appointment um, announcements today. Uh, members will be aware that our 2.7 million programme of investment into the local highways network is ongoing and is making strong progress across the county borough. This year's investment programme is targeting 40 local roads. While some temporary inconvenience is unavoidable, every effort is made to minimise disruption and to complete the work as quickly and effective, efficiently and effectively as possible. I'm sure that members will also welcome news of a number of children's play areas are set to benefit from a £700,000 programme of refurbishment, which will allow us more than 30 play areas to receive much needed investment. The first phase uh, will begin early next year and will target play areas in Aberkenfig, Betos, Blackmill, Blangaru, Grackla, Bridgend, Brinkethin, Kyra, Kevin Cribu, Kevin Glass, Canelli, Coitrahane, Evanstown, Kenfig Hill, 
Pencoid, Llangaina, Lewistown, Nantemoyle, Ogmovale, Penavay, Nottage, and last but not least, Wild Mill. The work will range from general refurbishment to a relaying of safer surfaces and the installation of new equipment. Funding is being sought for the next phase in this scheme, and I am looking forward to bringing you further details soon. Finally, I'd like to confirm that Carn Rovers FC have become the latest sports club to have successfully completed a community asset transfer. They are taking over the management of Cum Garu Pavilion and playing fields in the Garu Valley after agreeing a 35 year lease with the council. Funding of almost £11,000 is being provided to support them in making improvements and a further contribution of £10,000 is being provided to support the purchase of new pitch maintenance equipment. I'd like to congratulate the club and to take the opportunity to encourage further organisations to come and find out how they can work with us to protect and improve other community facilities within their areas. Thank you, Mr May. Thank you, Mr Baldwin. And the next, oh, we don't have, Councillor Burnett's not with us today, so the next couple of members for Wellbeing and Future Generations, Councillor Denisha Patel. Thank you, Mayor. Members will be aware that there are there continues to be a high demand for accommodation across Bridgend County Borough. To help meet the demand for temporary accommodation, the Council has entered into a new partnership with Katrevi Havard for a new private rent leasing scheme. The scheme aims to recruit private landlords to lease their properties for use as temporary accommodation for homeless people. With lease arrangements between one and three years, Landlords will be guaranteed to receive a rental income for the duration of the contract and will be paid monthly in arrears. The scheme includes a round the clock repair service, net, no setup fees, free garden maintenance. All participating properties are fully managed and are regularly inspected. And all this comes as um, all this is provided at no extra cost to the landlord. As well as providing an income and keeping the building in use, the scheme also reduces homelessness and to provide much needed temporary homes for both families and individuals whilst they are waiting for permanent accommodation. I hope members will give this scheme their support and will advise any landlords within your wards and areas to find out more about, vis about the scheme by visiting the Katravi Havard website. Thank you. Thank you for that. It's very interesting. And um, next cabinet member for education and regeneration, Councillor Charles Smith. Mr. Mayor, across the county borough, pupils have resumed school following one of the most disruptive periods in education that we've ever experienced. Schools and offices of the council have gone above and beyond in trying to minimise this disruption and have done a fantastic job under some very difficult and challenging circumstances. Throughout it all, the health and safety and well-being of pupils has remained our top priority, and this continues to be the case. The return to school has been supported in a number of ways. While Welsh Government no longer requires the routine use of face coverings within the classroom for either staff or learners, Schools and other educational settings have been able to determine themselves how they should be used in areas where there's likely to be more social mixing, such as in school libraries and common rooms. The exception has been school transport, where students in year seven and above are still required to wear face coverings while traveling on school transport vehicles. All secondary school students were asked to undertake a lateral flow test before their first day back and to continue to do so twice a week thereafter. Schools also have a range of um, specific processes in place, along with risk assessments, hygiene procedures and uh, adequate ventilation. To support students and their families, Frequently asked questions have been published on the Council website, which cover issues ranging from uniforms and school dinners to transport and health and safety. In the event that, that the situation changes 
and local risks differ from the national risk rating, we will work alongside schools and partners to put additional measures in place that will continue to prioritise the ongoing health, safety and well-being of all pupils. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Mr Smith. Thank you for that. <clears throat> and next item now is our Chief Executive. Mark, do you have any announcements? Thank you, Mr Mayor. Yes, I do. Um, I'll be as quickly as possible. Um, I delivered a report to Cabinet yesterday where I outlined progress that had been made around the Council's future operating model. And I thought members would find it informative if I just recapped some of that progress here. As you know, during the coronavirus pandemic, we found ourselves in a position where we had to adapt very quickly to rapidly changing circumstances. The lockdown period meant that the vast majority of Council staff had to be mobilised and equipped to work from home. Over the months that followed, we successfully delivered an increasing number of council services remotely or digitally, and we were able to study how we might learn from this experience to make fundamental changes to how we operate in the future. Following this ongoing review, we are now developing a new blended model of working, which could see staff dividing their time between both home and office. Members will be aware the Welsh Government has set new targets of enabling at least 30% of the workforce to operate from home by 2024, even though the current guidance says that if you can still work from home, effectively you should do so. The new model that we are currently working on reflects this ambition as intended to offer greater choice and flexibility. It is also designed to increase the efficiency of services for customers while continuing to effectively target those who are most in need. There are a number of potential benefits associated with this, including reductions in traffic, pollution and sickness absence levels, potential financial savings, greater well-being among our staff and work-life balance, improved retention and recruitment within key services and greater alignment with the Council's ongoing digitalisation strategy. With more than 6,000 staff delivering up to 800 different services within the Council, the new model will mainly affect employees who are office-based rather than those who work across areas such as schools or within depots. It goes without saying that we remain extremely proud of the way in which staff have pulled together to meet the ongoing challenges of COVID-19. This though represents a once in a lifetime opportunity to make fundamental changes and improvements to the working culture of the Council and follows hot on the heels of the most recent staff survey. The results of the survey uh, have so far been very encouraging and to give you an idea of some of the headline figures, more than a thousand staff responded to the survey. 86% stated that they enjoyed their role and 67% felt valued at work. 73% told us they were satisfied with the council as an employer and 66% had discussed their learning and development needs with their line manager within the last 12 months. Overall, staff were very positive about line management, with 74% delivering positive responses about support from their management and 82% citing opportunities for two-way communication to discuss and raise ideas and issues. 85% of staff stated they felt safe carrying out their role during COVID-19 and 83% felt reassured that the council is taking the appropriate health and safety measures to minimise risks associated in the workplace. And 72% and the majority of respondents felt that corporate communication during the COVID-19 pandemic had been effective. Of particular interest to our plans for developing a new model of work is the fact that 84% of people either agreed or strongly agreed that they can work productively within a remote environment. Overall, when comparing the seven questions that we use to measure trends uh, between staff surveys, staff were more positive in 2021 than in previous surveys carried out in 2020 and 2018, despite the challenges of the pandemic. We'll be studying the, these results very carefully and we'll be taking account of them in the development of the new model of working. Engagement with staff and trade unions on the proposals underway and further reports will be forthcoming, which will provide further details around what shape the new model will take. I will, of course, keep members fully updated as this progresses. Thank you. OK, thank you, Mark, for that. Very interesting. And let's hope um, we can get back to some normality soon. We are working in the right direction. And the next item at six is to receive announcements by the leader. Over to you, leader. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Members will have seen the latest coronavirus rates and how extremely serious the situation has become on a national scale across our entire health and social care system. The Council is experiencing unprecedented pressures across all services, but especially in areas such as adult and children's social care, early help, children's safeguarding and placements. These issues are being particularly affected by the challenges that we face in recruiting and retaining our social care workforce. Our capacity to respond to the need for providing care and support at home 
is proven to be especially challenging. And as Councillor Burnett reported the last meeting of Council, we are currently providing a total of 640 hours per week more than we did when compared to the same period last year. Faced with increasing need to extend existing packages of care and to provide care to more individuals, the key issue remains that residents may be forced to wait for these to become available. The situation continues to be extremely delicate delicate as a consequence of delays in people accessing and receiving NHS treatments, exasperations of chronic conditions due to long COVID, or increased social isolation issues as a result of staying at home, and the impact of all of this on family, friends and carers. The social care workforce are tired from the superhuman efforts of the last 18 months and the risk of burnout and attrition from the sector is very real. I cannot emphasise enough the need to recognise the situation is now at the most challenging point we have seen throughout the pandemic for social services. As government ministers recently commented that the entire system will remain under pressure while the pandemic is underway and we are expected to maintain a business as usual approach. Health Minister went as far as to state that while the situation may level off after October, we will still face our usual winter pressures such as flu and other respiratory viruses which may impact upon the system. However, we are continuing to present a strong response to these challenges. We have gold, silver and bronze level meetings taking place with health board colleagues on a regional level. We are prioritising care on a daily basis and a very detailed set of action plans in place and we are regularly reviewing, prioritising and coordinating essential services at a director and heads of service level. Since the last meeting of full council, a new recruitment drive has been launched for social care workers across areas ranging from home care and the reablement teams to young people's services. This is linked to the National We Care campaign run by Welsh Government and Social Care Wales, which is promoting the benefits of working in care and is also encouraging people to apply for roles in the sector. The recruitment drive focuses on the many benefits of working in this area and emphasises how full training and support help staff to make a positive difference in the lives of so many local people. Care worker recruitment features prominently in our action plan. We have reopened our six residential reablement beds at Brinakai and Brackler, and we've recruited an additional two new providers into our framework. Our social care rebuild and recovery plan is well developed in line with the Welsh Government's social care recovery framework. We are also in close contact with the whole social care sector and partners, and are continuing to support them in delivering care for the most vulnerable citizens. We want residents who are seeking work or may be considering their career options to understand that social care offers rewarding career opportunities for individuals from all types of backgrounds. We want them to realise that having the right values and being positive, caring and motivated are the most important qualities. We're also reminding residents who need information or advice about supporting themselves by accessing the many services available within their communities which can be done either through the council or our third sector partners. This includes using the council's common access point for services involving information and advice, the protection of vulnerable adults from harm or neglect, and support for people who care for others. Anyone seeking support from children and families can contact the council's information, advice and assistance services team, whilst our local community coordinators focus upon those whose needs would not usually be meeting the eligibility criteria for care and support. These coordinators form an important part of our overall preventative approach to maintaining independence and well-being, as do the many carers whom we continue to support via the Carers Trust South East Wales, which includes a 24-7 helpline. Unfortunately, one aspect of the current situation is it continues to pose a risk around increased complaints and queries via members. 
This is because a small proportion of people who we support may face delays in meeting their assessed needs, but we are doing all we can to sensitively and professionally address this under the reality of the circumstances we face. All members can support these efforts by promoting the social care recruitment initiative within our communities and encouraging people to come forward and find out more. In the meantime, staff are continuing to demonstrate exceptional dedication and determination. And I'm sure you will want to join me in thanking them once more for their ongoing efforts. The serious situation recently forced Kumtaf Mugano University Health Board to make changes around hospital visits and the collection of free coronavirus tests. Now people are currently only able to visit hospitals if a patient is receiving end of life care and the visit has been agreed in advance with specialist, specialist palliative care in patients. For pregnant women, one partner or support person is able to come to accompany them once they're confirmed as being in labour. This includes the immediate postnatal period prior to them transferring either home or to postnatal services. One person is able to accompany patients within paediatric and neonatal areas as agreed with clinical teams. However, no visiting is allowed in either the antenatal or postnatal wards. For ultrasound appointments, one partner is allowed to attend the 12 week dating scan, the 20 week anomaly scan and some scans arranged by the early pregnancy service. People attending outpatient appointments must do so alone but staff will provide support when needed and free Wi-Fi access is available to help people keep in touch with family and friends. The health and safety of patients, visitors and staff must obviously remain a top priority and I hope the communities throughout the borough will offer their support and understanding during this challenging time. Local vaccination rates remain very high and we recently broke through the 100,000 barrier for the number of residents who received both doses of the vaccine here in Bridgend. However, it remains vitally important for everyone to keep their guard up against coronavirus and do all that we can to stop it from spreading further. As part of the leave no one behind strategy, anyone aged 16 or over who has not yet received their first vaccination appointment can walk into a centre and receive one, while people aged over 18 who've already received their first, first dose can now do the same for their second vaccination. Welsh Government and health boards are currently considering new medical advice on whether the vaccine can be provided to young people aged 12 to 15. They're also considering how to implement the booster programme and we expect to know more details about the arrangements for how both of these will be delivered very soon. There are two groups of children within the 12 to 15 year old group, those who are extremely vulnerable and those who are not. Kumtaf Maganu will begin to vaccinate the vulnerable with those falling into the definitions expanded by the JCVI on the 3rd of September, being invited to community vaccination centres, including Ravenscourt next week. These children will receive two doses of the Pfizer vaccine. The first, the JCVI announced that those very vulnerable individuals who are severely immunosuppressed should receive a third dose of vaccine as part of their primary course. This third dose is recommended to be Pfizer. People in this category are being identified either by their clinician or via self-referral form. This process is underway and again vaccination will begin in community vaccination centres next week. We continue to work very closely with Kumtaf Muganug on the vaccination programme and as always I will share further details via email as soon as they are finalised. Other news as part of our commitment towards the UK's national Afghan relocations and assistance policy we've agreed to provide up to three families with safe homes and support and are waiting for further confirmation on how this will work. It has been heartening to see the overwhelmingly positive response that has been received from residents and the way in which many have asked how they might offer help and support. 
We've partnered with the Gender Association of Voluntary Organisations to consider this and would ask anyone who might be keen to help to visit the BARVA website for more information on what may be required. At this point in time, there's no item, there's, there's no requirement for items to be donated, but support may be needed with it, issues such as befriending, companionship, conversational English, showing people around the area, transportation, help with running errands and so on. Later, there's likely to be a need for more specialist services covering areas such as legal matters, tutoring and mentoring, mental and physical health and well-being. More information on the scheme and how it will work will soon be known, so look out for further details, which I will share with members. Finally, members may want to remind their constituents that dozens of employers and organisations will be exhibited in Bridgend Town Centre tomorrow as part of our first outdoor jobs fair. The free event, which will be based in various locations, including Dunraven Raven Place and Caroline Street, is being held between 10 o'clock and two o'clock. Organised in partnership with our Employability Bridgend and Job Centre Plus, it will feature free expert advice and support on a range of work, training and volunteering opportunities. Some of the employees who will be taking part include South Wales Police, Avon Cosmetics, First Cymru Buses, G4S, Careers Wales and a &R Cleaning Services, as well as MPS Industrial, Rubicon Wales Facilities Management, Harlequin Home Care and Wilmot Dixon, the construction company. With a range of temporary and permanent vacancies on offer, the job fair is an excellent opportunity for people to find work, change career or access new training, and I'm sure it will be a big success. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. OK, thank you, Leader. And uh, we are just coming up to almost two hours. Now it's 16.58 by my computer, so I propose we just have a short comfort break till 10 past five or 17, 10 hours. Which gives us 12 minutes, got on my laptop. So if we can just have that short break and then we'll move on and fall start with item seven, the scrutiny annual report at 10 past five, 17, 10 hours. <laughs> 